we once again are in the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 5. We took a, a little sideline last week to talk about faith as we've been talking a lot about faith and those things. And I thought <clears throat> it'd be good to at least kind of focus on what does that mean when we talk about faith, because there's a lot of definitions of that world of that word in the world. And uh, so when we talk about it from the biblical perspective, what faith is. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to read verses 1 through 11. So in the New Testament there, the epistle of Paul to the church in Ephesus, Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 1. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering, and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather <coughs> reprove them. So here we have the very beginning of this chapter, be therefore followers of God as dear children and walk in love. And that's where we were the last time and we were in Ephesians. We we're talking about what it means to be children of God, that not all men are children of God. But if we are children of God, how should we walk? What should we do? And here the Bible says we should walk in love as Christ also hath loved us. And so it even defines what that love is because there's another word, right, that has kind of many meanings in a lot of uh, different contexts, the word love, just like we talked about faith last week, right? Faith can mean a lot of things. People use it for a lot of different things. The same is with the word love, right? We, I can say I love pizza and I love my wife. Uh, hopefully those loves are different, right? We, uh, and, you know, if I love my wife the way the Bible says I should love my wife, I should be willing to sacrifice for her, right? To give my all, to do whatever for her benefit. Um, you know, I, I'm not that way towards pizza. Some might think that I am, that I would give my all to have a pizza. Uh, and sometimes I feel that way, right? But and it's a little bit of a, a silly idea. But really, right, We people say, I love pizza, and I love my children, or I love my wife, I love my family, those loves are different. And so Paul here, to make it clear, when he says walk in love, he defines what that love is, right? He explains it further by saying, walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. That's the kind of love he's talking about we should have. And uh, if we look at, if you keep your finger here, go back just a few books to 1 Corinthians 13. So you're in Ephesians, before that is Galatians, then you have 2 Corinthians, and then you'll get to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13. So it's just a, a little ways back, maybe 20 pages or so, depending on how big the print is, to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And this is a, a very famous chapter, often called the love chapter, because it speaks of love. And the word used here is charity, because that is that sacrificial giving, right? Christ gave himself for us, as Paul said in Ephesians. And here it's talking about and defining what is that sacrificial love, that charity. And in verse number three, or I'm sorry, verse number four, we read this. Uh, kind of a, a definition then of charity or how it behaves, this love that we're to walk in. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Now, that idea of suffering long there, right? That's that idea of patience, but enduring for the benefit of someone else. 
right? We, we talk about somebody being long-suffering, right? They're, they're willing to put up with it. They're willing to endure for the benefit of another person. This doesn't talk about, you know, causing ourselves to suffer, right? To, to intentionally go out and wound ourselves or something. That's not what this is saying. It's saying charity is willing to endure suffering for a long period of time because of the love it has for another party, for another person, for another thing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Right? We're to walk in this love. Charity envieth not. What is that? I want what he has. I want what she has. I deserve that. Why don't I have that, right? That's not love. Rather than saying, well, I deserve to have that too, Real love, biblical love, this love that Christ had says, what a blessing that they received that reward. What a joy is. I am rejoicing that God has blessed them with that. Right? Think about even between sisters, right? Not to fight over who had the bigger piece of cake, but to rejoice that your sister got the bigger piece of cake. And you can say to yourself, and if she eats the bigger piece of cake, she's going to get fat and I won't. Ha, ha, ha. You know, no, that's again, not that's not love, right? Love doesn't, we'll continue here. Love not only suffers long, not only is kind, not only doesn't envy, but it vaunteth not itself, right? That means it doesn't talk about itself. Look how great, how great I am. True love, that charity, wants others to be lifted up. Doth not behave itself unseemly. It's not doing anything wicked. It's not secretly trying to gain an advantage over here. That's the idea of, of acting unseemly doing something that people would be ashamed if they found out you did it, or you would be ashamed if others knew that you did it. And here, to go back to our illustration of the cake, seeketh not her own. Seeketh not her own. What is that, right? Charity is trying to do for others so that they receive a benefit rather than searching for your own benefit. Again, using that cake example, right? Rejoicing that your sister got the bitter, bigger piece of cake and being happy saying, you know what? I'm glad actually I will choose to give her the bigger piece of cake because I want her to be blessed. It, it, well, okay, cake is a simple example. It's a principle. And, and to me, this is, this is a phrase that convicts me every time I hear it, and often the Lord will bring it to mind when I am acting selfishly. Charity seeketh not her own, right? Charity isn't trying to get for it itself. That love that we're supposed to walk in, that Christ is our example of, is love that seeks the benefit of others. What can I do for you? And I mean that in a genuine sense, right? Not like some people will put on that show of, oh, what can I do for you? Or, you know, a shopkeeper. Oh, how can I help you today? But they really don't want to help you, right? They're just, it's just the job. They have to do it. Charity says, no, I, I want the best for you. And I'm willing to endure whatever it takes for you to have the best. My life is about you and not about me. You know, when we walk in that kind of love, think about the transformation that would bring within a, a family. What kind of transformation that brings in friendships, in, in relationships with neighbors, with, with those around us. If all of us acted that way, <clears throat> I want the best for you, whatever it costs me. And if you act the same way, you want the best for me whatever it costs you. Again, can you imagine the transformation that makes in our relationships, in marriages, in families, between brothers and sisters, between friends, between neighbors? Seeketh not her own. Notice, is not easily provoked, verse five continues. That it doesn't get angry real easily. And, and, and I can be just as guilty of this of just very quickly getting angry about something. But the Bible says if we walk in that love, then that love is, is not easily provoked. It does not 
easily get angry. Why? Because it thinketh no evil. That's the next phrase. What is that? This love, this charity, doesn't think evil of other people. And by that I mean, we would say it this way, it gives other people the benefit of a doubt. When somebody does something that we might be able to react negatively to it, they do something that actually hurts us, right? Somebody says something that's hurtful or does something that's hurtful to us. We have an option on how we react to that, right? We can get angry. We can be hurt. We can condemn that other person. Or we can think no evil. What we can say is, you know what? My friend, let's say his name's Bill. Bill didn't mean to hurt me with that. That was not Bill's intention. As a matter of fact, I don't think Bill even knows that he hurt me by doing that. Because I know Bill cares for me. That's thinking no evil. Saying even, even if something we, we could say is evil happened, like I was hurt, I was wounded by this. Charity says, but they didn't mean it. Right? It has that forgiveness there. That's thinking no evil. And, and that's a hard thing to do, right? Without God's love within us, we can't do that. We get hurt, we get angry, we're selfish. Verse six, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. And then again, we have this idea of long suffering and patience and that in verse seven. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all. If you just take that passage, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4 to 7, and strive to love others that way, it, it will transform your life, your outlook, your, your thinking, and the lives of those around you. Because that's what biblical love does. Now, that's the love that we're supposed to walk in. If we go back to Ephesians, so you go forward there from 1 Corinthians back to Ephesians 5. Walk in love as Christ also hath, also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. And we have verses 2 through 4. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints, right? Just that, that let it not be once named among you, not, not to exist at all, neither filthiness, foolish talking, jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. And I think the last time we spoke a little bit about that, that as well. In other words, God wants us to have purity in everything, in our, our words, in our actions, in our thoughts, right? To love as Christ love and to be pure in all that we do. You could sum up biblical Christianity in those two phrases. To love others as Christ loved them, right? To love as God loved, and to walk in that love, to do everything by that love, and to be pure in our words, deeds, and thoughts. What chapter is this? Uh, this is chapter five. Uh, chapter five, the verses uh, two, th in, a, in a sense, verses two through four. Of Ephesians. So then continuing, right, because there is talking about that purity, verse 5 then, verses 5 and 6. For this you know that this is Ephesians 5. I might have said Ephesians 4. I apologize if I did. Ephesians 5, verse 5. For this ye know that no whoremonger nor unclean person nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. So he's kind of continuing that thought of why we should be laying those things aside. We should be walking in light as Christ is, to love like Christ. Let no man deceive you, then it says in verse 6, with vain words. For because of these things, that is the uncleanness, the, the covetousness, the foolish jesting, the fornication, all that. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. And while Paul often talks about 
walking in love, about loving others, about walking in purity, about the blessings of God, about the hope of eternal life. Paul also repeatedly throughout his epistles does give us this reminder. Sin has a consequence. There is judgment. There is punishment. There is a penalty for sin. Right? They're not cute little things. There's a a joke that was going around the internet several years ago because there is a, I hesitate to call him a preacher. I would say he's more like a motivational speaker, but he claims to be a pastor and, and that. And he never refers to sin as something wicked or evil or, you know, and so the joke was going around. It was a picture of him and uh, with this quote, which wasn't really a quote of his, but you could picture him saying it. Those aren't sins. They're just oopsie daisies. See, Paul doesn't, Paul speaks the truth. Now, he, he tries to give us hope, right? He, re, he mentions the hope. He talks about that. But he also reminds us that there is a punishment for sin. God's wrath is poured out because of those sins. And when you think about wrath, just even that word, at least to me, even in the sound of it, it, it doesn't sound good. You know, wrath. It, it, it's guttural, right? It's, it has, just in the sound of the word, carries judgment. And you, you think about that idea of God's wrath being poured out, right? The ultimate righteous, holy, and just one pouring out wrath upon sin. And that's why Paul uses the word wrath there. He doesn't call it an oopsie daisy. He doesn't say there's, you know, a a minor penalty. He says God's wrath is poured out upon the children of disobedience. Now, as he talks about that, notice what he says before that, right? That that this phrase, the beginning of verse six. Let no man deceive you with vain words, right? Vain is empty, pointless, words without sustenance. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Why is he saying let no man deceive you? Because there is that idea in the world. Vain words, right? Empty lies. For instance, I'll give you an example. There are those that say, God is merciful. God is love. God is grace. Now, all those statements are true. I I do not disagree with that statement at all. God is merciful, very merciful. The Bible says his mercies are new every morning. It says in in the book of Lamentations in the Old Testament that his mercies are new every morning. It's because of his mercies that we have not been consumed. That is, because of his mercy, he hasn't poured out his wrath on us. Praise the Lord for his mercy. He is merciful. God is gracious. And you can think about mercy and grace as kind of two sides of the same coin. Right? Grace is receiving something that I don't deserve. And mercy is not getting what I do deserve, right? The punishment that I do deserve. They're they're related concepts. Mercy allows me to go free even though I don't deserve it. Grace then blesses me with something that I don't deserve. God is merciful. God is gracious. God is loving. But there is a false teaching out there in the world that says, because God is merciful and loving and gracious, there won't be punishment. A loving God, and I've heard this argument, a loving God would not send a person to hell. And maybe you've heard that. And maybe you've had that question. If God is love, how could there be eternal punishment? That doesn't seem loving. God is love, but God is also just. And if you think about it in light of and context of scripture and that 
It's because of his love that he sent Jesus Christ so that no one has to go to hell. That is, God is not actually the one that sends anyone to hell. Justice demands the punishment, but God has also made a way of escape. But because he's just and loving, think about this. He provides us an option. He does not force himself on anyone. God doesn't force anyone to believe in himself. He gives us a choice. Because if he forced us to believe in him, right? like forced love isn't love. Right? If, I, if I came up to you and I put a gun to your head and I said, tell me you love me. Right? You'd probably say, I love you, Jeff. And I might say, say it like you really mean it. Okay, I love you. That's not love. That's fear. That's you going, okay, this guy's he's ludicrous. You know, he's something slipped a disc in his head. I don't know. But okay, he put a gun to my head and said, tell me that you love me. I'll say I love you. I don't have to mean it. Right? Forced love isn't love. God doesn't send anyone to hell. It's our sin and actions that send us to hell. You know, the same question. How could a loving God allow someone to get a disease and die? Well, see, that wasn't God's plan in the beginning, right? God made the world perfect with no disease. Disease is a consequence of man's sin. So, God's not the one that brought the disease. It's our sin that brought the disease. Death came because of sin. God is a loving God, but he also is a just God. And he will pour out his wrath on disobedience. But there's a false teaching, right? These are vain words, empty words. God is love. He won't condemn anybody. Do whatever you want. It doesn't matter. In other words, and they may not say that phrase, but that's their intention. That's the meaning. God is love. He'll forgive all. Yes, God is love and God is able and willing. Right? The Bible says he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. But there's a requirement. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But, you know, we have to meet the first condition, right? It's a condition. If, if we confess our sins, then, right? if you study conditional logic, you have if statements and that, you know, if A, then B follows. In order to have B, A has to be true. So if we confess our sins, then, right, that's the B. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Because he's merciful, because he's loving, because he's gracious, yes. But it's not just because he's loving and gracious. He's just going to wipe out all sin and we can do whatever we want. There's no punishment. What happens in a nation where there's no law? Where there's no punishment for crime? Chaos, right? Anarchy. Everybody does whatever they want. And honestly, that's not love. If a parent never says no to a child, that's not love. Children don't know necessarily what's going to hurt them. Think about, especially small children, right? Everything looks like food to a small child. <laughs> Pick it up and what's the next thing you know? It's going in the mouth, right? You just watch any small child at a playground in a park. Um, they will walk around, pick things up, hold it. And if you don't look carefully, sure enough, within a few minutes, whatever it is, is going to go in the mouth. Is it cruel for the mom to say no or the dad to say no? 
or sometimes, right, that rip it out of the child's mouth, right? Sometimes you got to get in there, pinch the cheeks and, and pull it out. And then the child cries. Was the mom wrong? Was the dad wrong? Were they cruel? No, that was actually love, right? That punishment that came was love. So this idea, there's no wrath. God understands, right? He knows we're all sinners. And... But Paul says, don't let anyone deceive you with that idea. Which says to me, we can talk about the wickedness in the world today and go, wow, how could people approve of all this sin? You realize this is somewhere around 60, 65 AD, I forget, maybe 50 AD. It's around that time period that Paul was writing the book of Ephesians. <laughs> so less than 100 years after Jesus Christ, Nearly 2,000 years ago from our day today, right? We're in 2024. So give it another 25, 30 years, and it's 2,000 years ago. What did Paul write? Let no man deceive you with vain words. In other words, what was happening? People were saying, this is okay. Uncleanness fornication, foolish jesting, dirty jokes, all that. That's not new. Not only is that not new, but people saying, and God's okay with it, is also not new. There were false teachers in that time. And Paul wrote about that in other places, and Peter wrote about it. And Paul says, don't be deceived. Don't let someone deceive you into thinking that there isn't punishment for sin, that God's wrath won't be poured out. Don't just think, oh, God understands. Look, he does understand who we are. But because he understands who we are, he has given us his word and his law to remind us that these things are not good for us. Just like that loving parent that says to the small child, don't eat that stone. Why? Bad for your teeth. Probably bad for all kinds of other things within your body. Don't touch that. It's dirty. It, love actually puts boundaries. As much as sometimes I mock this, and I will at home sometimes as well, I'll tell Grace that I hear her voice in my head with like, you know, you shouldn't, you don't need to eat that. I'll, I'll hear it even when she doesn't say it. You don't need to eat that. But I do think that she says those things out of love, at least either that or she's just like, I don't want a fatso standing next to me. Maybe that's it. No. Do I really say anything? I, I hear you say it. I... <clears throat> Sometimes you do, though. You're like, do, do you really need to eat that? You'll say that. And usually when you do say it, uh, yes, I do. Oh, stubborn, uh, uh, from stubbornness. Oh, stubbornness. In my head, I had oh, inat, which is in stubbornness in Bulgarian. And, and then I half mixed it. Uh, in stubbornness sometimes. But... Why, why would she say, you know, in other words, maybe it's not such a good idea to eat that, you know? Maybe, you know, one pizza is enough. Maybe you don't need to eat three of them. Love puts boundaries and corrects and directs. This is in the context of walking in love, but then not being deceived into thinking, and here's the other side of that coin, right? We're to walk in love. What is, and we see this today, but I think they had it in the time of Paul, maybe not as public, maybe not as far reaching as it is today. But today we have this idea, if you tell me you're, I'm wrong, you don't love me, right? It's hate speech 
to say I'm wrong. It's hate speech to speak against sin, is the way they phrase it. And, and there are those who say, you can't say that. We have to love everyone. Let no man deceive you with vain words. We need to speak the truth in love, right? Graciously showing love in our actions towards others, but still to speak the truth. But, and, and to not let people be deceived to think that there's not consequences, there's not uh, punishment for sin, there's not a, a result, there's not a judgment coming. Related to that, we, we also have this idea, because he says in verse 7, be not ye partakers, uh, be, be not ye therefore partakers with them. Not only do we have this idea and this false teaching in the world that everything's just okay and God's not going to punish sin. The other false teaching is this idea. We're under grace, not under the law. And that means, when they say that usually, we can do whatever we want because God has already forgiven us. We don't, we don't need to strive for holiness we're under grace. We don't have to follow the law. We don't have to do those things. We're, we're free to do whatever we want. Now, if you go back just one book, we're in Ephesians. Go back to Galatians. It's right before Ephesians. It's the book of Galatians chapter 5. Because Paul addressed that in Galatians 5. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty. Right? We have liberty. Liberty, wherewith Christ hath made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. He's talking about, actually, the law. Right? The, the Jewish law, we take the Old Testament, the Tanakh, you know, that, that law that God gave. And Paul is saying, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. That we, we aren't under the law. That's true. And be not entangled again. He's saying, basically, don't put yourself back under this yoke of the law, that yoke of bondage. If you can picture that yoke with, you know, a couple of cows pulling a plow or something, the, the bondage that that is, the slavery. Verse 2, behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. So he's talking about the, the deeds of the law. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. So Paul says, look, if you're, you know, if you're thinking that you're righteous because of the law, then now you have that burden. You've got to keep the whole law, which you can't do. And you've fallen from grace, this idea that God is willing to forgive us because of Jesus Christ. So on the one hand, he's talking about the liberty that we have, that we are not bound by the law because the law just shows us that we are unrighteous and that we need Christ. But once we are in Christ, right, we are forgiven and now we have liberty, we have freedom. We don't have to keep the law, right? I don't, I, I if I... Don't keep the Sabbath day. I'm not, it, it doesn't mean I'm going to go to hell. If I don't hear, he talks about the example of circumcision, the other laws in the Old Testament. <clears throat> it's not going to send you to hell. We have liberty. But notice verse 13, skip ahead. And I would encourage you, you could read the, the whole book, even of Galatians talks a lot about this. But verse 13, for brethren, ye have been called under liberty, right? So it's that same discussion here he's having. We have that liberty in Christ. You have been called under liberty only, notice this warning, use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another, which we saw back in Ephesians as well. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So he says, yes, look, we have liberty, but, you know, we could, if you think about this, right, ditches on both sides of the road. I can go into the one ditch where I put myself under the law and I'm in bondage to it and I'm a slave to it. And now I'm ignoring that freedom that I had. I'm laying aside the freedom I had in Christ. But on the other side is this idea of, 
We're under grace, not under the law, so we can do whatever we want. And Paul says, don't don't take that liberty then and really abuse it. By where he says, you have been called under liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. That is, I'm free. God's not going to judge me. I get to go to heaven because of Jesus Christ. And therefore now, I don't have to strive for holiness. I don't have to follow his word. I'll just do whatever I want. In one hand, Paul says, okay, you can do that. But he says, don't. Right? It's not, it's not profitable for you. It's not profitable for those around you. And this, I think, if we go back to Ephesians, and we'll conclude there today in Ephesians 5, when Paul says, let no man deceive you with vain words, he's kind of talking about both of those camps there, both of those sides. Those who say, there is no judgment. It doesn't matter. Do whatever you want because God is merciful. All men will be saved. That's not true. That's a vain and empty thing. But there's also the other side that says, because of Christ, if we're in Christ, we can do whatever we want. And Paul says, no, no, wait, that, that's a vain and empty teaching also. Right? We shouldn't be partakers in these actions if we're in Christ. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light, and the Lord walk as children of light. That's the challenge that Paul's giving to us. To walk in love to walk in holiness, to walk in the light of Christ as children of light, if we are in Christ. Understanding that there is punishment for sin. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your word today and for the opportunity just to spend some time uh, away from the things of the world and to spend time with you, not only in singing, but Lord, also in studying of your word. Lord, I ask you to help us to understand the things that are written here and then to make application in our lives, Lord. I'm sure each of us has had different thoughts as we've gone through that text, Lord, and there's many applications uh, of these things, Lord. Help us in doing that, Lord, and actually being uh, doers of the word and not hearers only. Lord, I ask you to bless us through the week, Lord, to guide our steps, help us, Lord, and direct us. Help us to be followers of you, Lord, to strive for holiness in every area of our life, Lord, to be more and more like Christ every day. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.